Hi everyone, welcome back to Happy Little Diodes. Cast your minds back to the end of last month, and you'll remember that we booted up all five of these spectrums, and we found that Willy was the only one with any kind of issue. We took the case apart, and did the initial tests as described by Jules Bakulong's video. When we plugged it in, the current draw was oscillating up and down like this. The video output looked like this. Obviously, it's not booting up correctly, and this appears to be an issue with the lower RAM. In this video, I want to give you enough information to understand why that is a safe assumption for a video output that looks like this. So let's start with the basics. We have the white border, and within that, the screen is divided into cells like this, 32 across by 24 vertically. I make that 768 cells in total. If we zoom into a cell, we can see that it's made up of 8x8 eight eight pixels. Each row of 8 pixels is stored in a single byte of memory, which means the 64 bits of pixel data that make up a cell are stored across 8 bytes. And doing the maths, we can see that 6144 bytes of pixel data define our entire screen. Let's take a familiar example with Jet Set Willy. We could draw his head like this, one cell of data, split up into pixels, stored across 8 bytes, and it would look something like this. So where are these 6 kilobytes of pixel data stored? Let's take a look at the layout of a Specky's memory. We have the first 16 kilobytes of data in the ROM, and then 16 kilobytes of lower RAM, and it's actually within these 16 kilobytes that the pixel data is stored. That's the 6,144 memory locations between addresses 16,384 and 22,527. Of course, it's not enough just to define the pixel data. We also need to know about colours, and these are stored in what's called attribute data in the next 768 memory locations. That's 768 locations corresponding to the 768 cells that make up the screen. Now, each of these eight lower memory chips contributes one bit of data to a byte of memory. That means when the CPU addresses the memory, it sends the same address to all eight chips. Let's go back to our example. Byte 3 of Jet Set Willy's head looks like this. So, each of the memory chips in low memory contributes the corresponding bit, as shown in the diagram. So that very basically explains how the graphical data is stored in the lower memory. In fact, if you poke these 8 bytes of data directly into lower memory, into the correct locations so as to draw up a cell, Jet Set Willy's head would appear on the screen. Armed with that information, let's go into the startup routine of the Specky. The first thing it does is it tests all of the memory by writing the decimal value 2 to every location starting from the highest memory location, all the way down to the bottom of lower memory. Let's see what that looks like in terms of the cells that we just learned about. Decimal 2 corresponds to 1 0 in binary, so bit 1 of every single byte of pixel data is set to a 1, creating this column of 1s. Now 1 0 in the attribute data corresponds to red ink on black paper. So we should end up with a red column and black paper behind it in every cell, don't forget. So here's an example piece of code that I knocked together to demonstrate what happens if you fill the memory up with the value 2. I'm setting up a loop that defines n as a value from 16384 to 23295. That's the bottom of our pixel data all the way to the top of our attribute data. I'm going to poke the value 2 into every value and go in a loop. You can see that these columns are being slowly built up, and when we get to the attribute data, they're all going to turn red on black paper. Like that. Let's compare this to the fault we have. It looks kind of similar, except you kind of have these road marking dashed red lines in between each of the columns. Now maybe you agree, but I think those dashed red lines are exactly halfway between each of the solid red lines. And exactly halfway would correspond to bit 5 of every byte of pixel data. 
So I'm going to run that example again, but instead of poking the value 2 into each um, address, I'm going to poke 34, because 34 is binary 001, 00010. This is effectively simulating a bad chip 11 in the lower memory, that it's re always returning a 1 instead of a 0. The result is what you might expect. You get the solid columns like we did before, but we also have an extra solid column in between each of the columns we had before. In effect, we have double the amount of red lines. Now, interestingly, our paper's going green now, and that's because the value we've poked in in attribute data corresponds to green paper. Now, you're going to have to take my word for this, but this Becky did start to fill the screen up green sometimes while it was failing to boot, which means this theory about bit 5 being bad is looking pretty good. Sometimes this kind of uh, debugging is enough to identify the correct chip, but lucky me, my good friend Salyor contacted me through Patreon and sent me this smart card to use. Never had one of these and I'm quite excited to use it. Theoretically, when I plug this in and turn on the specy, it's just going to tell me which chips are broken and I can replace them and we're good to go. Of course I could have done this from the start, but that wouldn't have been quite as interesting or informative. Let's see what it can do. Interestingly, I can see those bugged out pixels already in kind of a, a dashed line across every cell. And here we go. Lower RAM error. Bad bits. Suspect ICs IC11. Perfect. I think that's telling me that it expected FF to be read back, and it read back DF. So I guess the diagnostic ROM fills the memory up with FF, which is all ones, and reads it all back expecting FF. I imagine it does the same thing with all zeros as well. Lovely, so let's get that bad chip out. One of these days I'm going to get myself a desoldering pump, but for now I'll just keep practicing with the sold sucker. What I'm doing here is very important. I'm trying to make sure that each of the legs of the chip is moving freely, and that means I've successfully removed all the solder and the chip should just fall out. But I really want to draw attention to this particular part of the process, because although a leg might appear to be moving freely from the bottom, it might still be attached at the top. All of these legs were moving apparently freely, but here when I apply some force from the top, you can see that some of them are still stuck. So if I were to try to remove this chip, I'm at risk of lifting the pads on the top side of the board and damaging the tracks. Just take a look at this damage that I managed to do when removing a ULA. Going back to the underside of the board, I want to show you again how freely moving legs might not necessarily mean the chip is ready to come out. Each of these legs appears to be moving freely, but when I get to this uh, fifth one in and apply some force, it comes free. And now take a look. That's ready to come out. But I'm still going to be very careful. You can see that all of the legs on the other side of the chip aren't necessarily free. So the chip is tipping up like this, which is great. One side has been cleanly removed, but this first pin on the right hand side is stuck. So I'm just going to apply some heat with a very fine solder tip, and it pops out. Now the chip's going to lift out without me having to use a heat gun or anything ugly like that. And now that it's removed, let's have a quick look to make sure we haven't damaged any of the traces or pads. Okay, now we're looking good. Here I'm just showing off how organised I am. And we're ready to solder in a socket. So I'll pop it in the top there, flip the board over and get to work.
Excellent. Now cross your fingers, we're going to boot it up. Hooray, brilliant. That just leaves a recap and this specy should be good to go. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for more videos soon.